Hello, everyone, and welcome back for lunch. If you're thinking about going into a food coma, don't even think about it, because we are about to go down the rabbit hole of how you are going to get properties over the phone. Raise your hand if you would like to call more people over the phone, but you just dread doing it. Just dread it. You know, you want to do it, but you just absolutely dread it. Yeah? A lot of people, okay. Raise your hand if you think you could close more closable deals if you knew that you would know what to say in every single situation. I can teach you that today. So why are we here, guys? Why are we sitting here today? Because everyone here in this room understands that this is the best wealth building opportunity. I've never seen a better one. And because of that, all of you have made the time to come sit in these seats and learn about how to do that, how to provide that legacy for your family and for yourself so that you have the time freedom to do the things that are important to, to you, making yourself wealthy instead of someone else. And also, as we all know, whenever you go and you do a flip, you're making the neighborhood better. We've seen how whenever you go through neighborhoods, you're driving for dollars, you see that these communities need that type of transition that we're providing. So how can I add value to my network? I believe it's important to do what you love. And I, my background is in psychology. I wanted to go and become a therapist. But as much as that would be taking care of other people, that income wouldn't exactly be taking care of my family. So I had to choose to do something where I could still help people but also be helping my family as well. So I decided to go into off-market real estate investing so that I could uh, still help people. And I've done over 14,000 hours of speaking on the phone with people over the last six years. That's a lot of time. And so sometimes I'll start at 8 a.m. on the East Coast and then go all the way to 11 p.m on the West Coast, so I find out where the best markets are in the United States. And I would say on average, I can close maybe 10 deals a month, and depending on your exit strategy, that could be a profit of anywhere from 50,000 to 400,000 a month. So I definitely work hard to earn my keep and uh, make sure that I'm profitable both for myself as well as the investors who choose to hire me on their behalf. So talking to sellers, the logistics, what's working in 2021? Like Jim said, everyone's kind of beaten up in terms of the phones. We have people who are having cold callers from all over the world in all different types of industries. We're all getting calls for auto warranty. Raise your hand if you haven't had a call for auto warranty. Anybody? Today, yeah, someone said today. And so how do we get through to sellers in a market where the phones are just beaten up, texts are beaten up, how do we get through? Well, the way we get through is you have to do multimodal, text, email, ringless voicemails, videos, in person, some people are doing radio and television. You have to make it a multi-point system in order to get those deals that you need to get. But calling is of course always a great first step and if you can't get through, try everything else. Okay, so I have a house full of boys and, you know, they love Marvel. So if anyone here is a Captain America fan, Steve starts out as this skinny kid and because of his character, he becomes this great American hero. And that is how I feel it is whenever you're trying to start out calling these sellers on the phone and you're terrified and you feel, how can I do this, right? And after time, you end up like Steve on the right. So how do you begin? Just like going to the gym, you just start with one day. One day, you make that commitment. No matter how much I don't wanna be there, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make that one first call. And you have to push through the phase of being terrified and terrible. When I first started, I had an investor hire me and he said, Jennifer, legitimately, that is the worst call I have ever heard possibly in my life. <laughs> and, uh, but he believed in me. 
And so he kept training me. And because he believed in me, he gave me that ability to keep pushing. And I want you to know that because you're sitting here and only because you're sitting here, I absolutely have that same belief for you as well, no matter how terrible and terrified you may feel. So give yourself the grace and the space to push through that phase in time that it takes to push through being terrible and terrified. You will get there. And the first call is absolutely the hardest. So you can be effective on your first call, even if you're not excellent. Excellence takes time. The way I built my confidence for that first call is I just mastered one exit strategy because eventually somebody is going to say yes. And when they say yes, you need to know what to do. I was talking with a friend last night and she said, you know, I'm used to no and when I finally got a yes, I didn't know, I, I didn't know what to do. You're, you're not supposed to say yes. But if you have one exit strategy that's ready to go, then you'll have that confidence to take that first step and that first call. And of course, you wanna stack as many exit strategies as you can in terms of your knowledge because you wanna monetize every single person that tells you that they wanna sell their house in some way. But just start with one exit strategy that you know very well. And also a mindset that I have, you can't be nervous if you're trying to help them. Think about a paramedic who shows up at the scene of a car wreck. Is he nervous for himself? Or is he focused on the person whose life he's trying to save? Right, that's right. And I feel like we are the people who show up on the scene to help these people. And if they don't need our help, then we just move on to the next person. So if you feel nervous, just remember the mindset that we are there to help other people in their time of need because if they're ready to sell at a discount, most likely there is some form of distress, one way or the other. Some examples might be you know, downsizing after losing a spouse. I get these calls all the time. Often they are high equity, and I would say on those, don't wait because once they get used to living alone, they're pretty cool with it. So. If they are ready to downsize and they, um, they just lost a spouse, you know, go ahead and do not wait on those. And then another example is I did an acquisition on a commercial restaurant a couple of weeks back. I'm sure some of you know there's great opportunity in commercial right now. I know Tom's gonna speak on that if you have the stomach for a little bit of risk. This restaurant had continued to do well through COVID, but their challenge, like many of us here as entrepreneurs, they were having trouble finding workers. So a successful restaurant is now having their own family, brothers, sisters, daughters, working in this restaurant. And they were tired of spending their Saturdays working in the restaurant. So what we did is we gave them an opportunity to sell the restaurant at a good price so that they were no longer having to work their weekends. So here's just a basic cold calling intro script, right? And I'm gonna just go ahead and read it. Yeah, hi, is this Tom? Yeah, hi, Tom, this is Jennifer. Sorry to call you out of the blue, but I was calling about a property that I believe you own on Springdale Avenue. And I just wanted to see if you'd maybe thought about selling your property and if you might wanna consider a cash offer on it. And that's it, leave it at that. And so you wanna get a pre-qualified list. You know, you wanna see if there are any fires that you can put out, but don't ever mention what pre-qualified list you're calling on. I'm sure some of you know this because it upsets them. So you don't wanna say, hey, I'm calling because of that tax lien or hey, I'm calling because you know, your grass is super tall and your porch is caving in. You just let them know that, you know, we were driving past and we saw your house and we're looking to purchase in your neighborhood. Never mention the pre-qualified list that you're calling on. It very much upsets them. So when you're talking to warm sellers, this is an intro that I use and I've honed it in the field every day with very specific language for a reason. And I say, yeah, hi, Bill, this is Jennifer. Sorry to call you in the sorry to call you out of the blue, 
But I saw that you had called me back on our ringless voicemail campaign, or you give us a call back. And I just wanted to see if you were by chance still thinking of selling your property on First Street, or if you were already under contract. Now notice I don't say, were you still thinking of selling? Because as soon as they get you on the phone, they are nervous. They're like, oh no, no, I changed my mind. You know, I, how many, how many has, have, has that happened to you guys where you give them a call back and they're like, no, I completely changed my mind. So I give them two options. Were you still thinking of selling or are you already under contract? Either way, I'm psychologically moving them towards getting them under contract. You do not want to give them an option for an out because they will take it. So that gets us to screening motivation. Let's say they do, yeah, sure. I'll hear an offer, right? We hear that all day long. Sure, I'll hear an offer. So the most important slide out of this entire presentation is you want to know the four pillars of qualification. Price, timeline, motivation, and the condition of the property. So this is a typical conversation and I'm condensing thousands of calls, trying to frame these four pillars naturally for you guys, right? Because you want to make it very conversational, very natural, that way it feels like a conversation with a buddy, right? Very comfortable. So after the intro, you ask permission and set ex I would say that many gurus will tell you that you need to set an expectation on time frame. Hey, do you have five minutes? Do you have 10 minutes? And I've taken expensive courses from people telling me this. I disagree with that. Because if you ask people for five minutes, they're gonna say, no, click. So I just move straight into the conversation. I do not set time expectations unless they ask. So, and they say, so, sure, what's your cash offer? And I say, awesome. I'd love to get you that cash offer. Have you been thinking about selling for a while or kind of just since I called? Do you get a lot of calls like this? I added that last one in 2021 because most people are getting a lot of calls. So I follow up that question with, have you been thinking about selling for a while or just since I called? Because this is probably the most important question you can ask. If they've been thinking about selling for a while, that means that most likely they're more motivated. If they tell you, nah, just since you called, I, don't, I can't remember doing any deals where that was the answer. So just something to keep in mind. Not saying it happens, but I don't remember that ever happening. So this is the greatest indicator of motivation is how long. So an example would be, well, ever since the tenant stopped paying rent, well, ever since our children left for college a couple of months ago, Ever since the neighbors moved in and their kids still are stuff outside, it's just really getting old with my bike parts missing and everything else. Or ever since the upstairs neighbors started leaking and there's mold coming through the ceiling. That was an acquisition I did on a townhome for a guy who was just living with it because he felt helpless. And how sad is that? He didn't know he had options to sell his property and get into a property that was more healthy for him. So whenever you're screening for motivation after you ask the question, how long have you been thinking about selling? Here are some more examples of that and I'm happy to send you these slides. I try to be as thorough as possible so that you guys would have all the tools you needed in order to get started calling for yourself or training a team. Timeline, so how soon do you need to sell? This is an important one because as you know, it's not just the price, it's also the terms of the contract. Right, so here are some typical answers. Any time is fine. This needs the pain points to be brought to the surface to create urgency. Okay, any time is fine, great. So if you did sell, what would you do with that money in your pocket? What do you think you'd do with it? Would you go on vacation? Would you get an RV and travel? So you have to create an urgency in the conversation whenever they give you a bland answer like this. Or another one that I get every single day is, well, it depends on the offer. Okay, and what I say to that is, so if you were able to get the price that you're looking for, how soon do you think you might wanna sell? Great, so if I offer that price today, you'll be able to sign? And it kind of calls them out, like, 
you know, you put them on the spot for some commitment. And a more definitive answer means go time. I need to sell in two weeks before we move out of the country. Obviously, that's a golden opportunity, and you'll be glad you asked that question. So condition of the property is important. This is more of a rapport building space because people, I see him nodding, people love to talk about their property. So one of the first things I say whenever I get people on the phone is I say, you know, I'd love to give you credit for any major upgrades, repairs, or renovations that you've made to the property in the last 10 years. And people have to think about it, so I try to jog their memory on the expensive stuff. Have you done anything to say the roof, furnace, AC, windows, anything like that in the last 10 years? Have you remodeled the bathrooms? Have you remodeled the floors? And then you're gonna get a laundry list, and they're gonna tell you so much more than you ever wanted to know. But you listen. Some people, some of my teachers have said, you do not let them go down this rabbit hole or you will stay stuck there. I disagree. You let them stay on that rabbit hole as long as they want. Because by you showing that you're willing to listen to them and that you care, your negotiations are gonna go so much deeper and so much better. And also, you can tell what they haven't done by what they have done. So I never ask them what repairs need to be done on the house because they know we're gonna use that to leverage against them. Sellers are smart, especially right now. So don't ask, well, what do you think needs to be done? You will know what they haven't done by what they tell you they have done. So if they say in the last 10 years I've only done the roof, what does that mean? Everything else, exactly. That means <laughs> we've probably got foundation problems, we need new windows, bathrooms need to be remodeled. It's good they did the roof. So just don't make them uncomfortable by asking them what needs to be done. You'll be able to tell that by them bragging about what they have done. So a transition, right? I always do price last unless they just insist on an offer immediately and rudely and maybe not even then. So we're just asking here, not negotiating. Some investors don't like asking about price because it gets in their head and can discourage them. John Martinez is a good example of this. He does not like asking price because if they give him a high price, he's less likely to be aggressive with that lead. But I like to know it just as a basis point for what's in their head and where do I need to bring them down. It doesn't matter what they want because you can only pay what you can pay, but just knowing where they're at can be helpful depending on your psychology. But if you know it's gonna psych you out and keep you from pursuing a lead further, then don't ask this question. So I might say, hey, if you've been keeping an eye on the market and did you have a price in mind? Or hey, how much were you guys thinking you might wanna sell for? You wouldn't have any idea, would you? By adding that little phrase, you wouldn't have any idea, would you? People have a natural tendency to wanna to correct you. So if you say, there's no way you'd know what price you wanna sell right now, right? They'll go, well, actually, yeah. So here are some non-threatening questions that you can ask on price. So if we were able to fix everything, clean everything, pay all the closing costs, no realtor's fees, you wouldn't have any idea on how much you would want, would you? So again, like I said, just using that last little phrase to get them to correct you to get the answer that you're looking for. So typical responses to price that I hear every day is, I wanna hear your answer first. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you have gotten that response. <laughs> I wanna hear, your answer first every day. I say absolutely, totally understand that. It's important to me that we create a well-considered offer solution based on everything you've shared with me today and everything you've done to it, how soon you need to sell and what other houses have sold for in the neighborhood. Those are all variables I take into consideration to make sure I'm getting you the most accurate offer possible. I know that's long, so it depends on the personality. You can shorten it up. So to respect your time, when would be a good time to go over a serious offer? And you get that commitment, and that's part of the theme. Sorry about your feedback. Not at all. <laughs> Little feedback never hurt anybody, right? <laughs> yeah. So you want to get a commitment before you give a price. Can everyone still hear me? I've got theater training, so I can get plenty loud without a mic. Good. Good all right. <laughs> uh, so, so to shorten it, so to respect your time, when would be a good time 
to go over a serious offer. Remember that. They only want your price. That's all they care about. So you make sure before they give a, you get a price, they give you a commitment. So here's some low hanging fruit cues. So whenever I set up phone systems for myself or for investors, I always make sure it has a transfer function. Because if I have a VA that gets these, or if I'm doing acquisitions for another investor, I make sure that I can transfer uh, home sellers who tell me these things immediately. If they say, I'm meeting with an investor or realtor tomorrow. While I have an offer sitting in front of me right now from someone else, how many of you guys have done an acquisition with someone who had an offer sitting on their desk from someone else? Good job. This is rare low hanging fruit. You need to run, don't walk to those people because they're going to sell to somebody. So for example, if someone says, I have a meeting with a realtor or an investor tomorrow at 1 p.m., you need to be there at 8 a.m. with a contract in hand. Beat that other person and that's where we've converted the most deals. So negotiation, that is where the rubber hits the road. We start negotiating the minute we're born. We may not like negotiation, may not feel good or natural in a polite culture. As Americans, it's just a little bit, it's a little bit icky for us, right, in our culture. But to make you feel better, What's the first thing you do whenever you're born? You cry. And what are you crying for? <laughs> to have your needs met. You're negotiating with someone out there in this brave new world that you're in this cold to take care of you, make you warm, and feed you, right? So we're born negotiating. You may not like it, but the sooner we learn how to do it well, the better our life is going to be. So in the off-market space, there's negotiating on terms or price, right? And so with negotiation, a lot of people don't understand that terms can be part of it. So you can try to talk to them about terms, but oftentimes they're gonna be focused on price. So mindset is really important. I've been doing this for six years, which I know is a drop in the bucket compared to many of you. But I've been doing this long enough to know that you really need to come from a place of having their best interest in mind before you start a true negotiation. Because it will eat at you if you try to make a quick buck. You will burn out. And plus, they sense it. They sense it if you don't have their best interest in mind. They will know it and it kills your deals and it kills your referrals. At the same time, we do have a duty to take care of ourselves and our families. And as we all know, price of materials has gone up, labor is hard to come by, the price has come up, so make sure you're taking care of yourself. Don't be so hungry to get a deal that you're going to a place where you're not gonna be able to take care of your family. We need to make it win-win. And if this is coming from a genuine place, it will come across more times than not. And the more exit strategies you have, the more you can create win-win scenarios. This is my favorite phrase that I learned from my longest term client. It's called the ideal scenario. Conversations will get stuck. Think of it like going down the river. You will get stuck in inlets and conversations and you won't know how to get back on track. So here's the question. The sooner you can ask it appropriately or if you get off track, the sooner you can get them on the roadmap to where they want to go. And here it is, you say, you know, you've told me about how you might want to sell. What would be the ideal scenario for you? On closing day, how much is in your pocket? And when are we closing? It's a simple question, but it will get you out of some sticky, sticky places. My client at the time used the phrase, you know, if your fairy godmother was to come, but I realize it's not going to be a phrase that's gonna be natural for most of us, but it does certainly set the picture for what she was trying to convey that we can make whatever they want to happen, happen on whatever price they wanna sell on, depending on your exit strategies or how soon, we can make this happen for them. And we need to be sure that we can communicate that so that we can monetize on every single person we come across who wants to sell their property. So the benefits of building rapport like I said, you know, a lot of people say that 
You don't need to be spending a lot of time on these calls. You need to keep them brief, especially if you have employees, you're doing quality control, you're checking the time. Well, I agree with Chris Voss, as we all know, the, the big negotiator for the FBI and the book, Never Split the Difference. He said the more time you put in building rapport, the more negotiations will go smoothly. And if it's good enough for Chris Voss, it's good enough for me. And so I really do spend a lot of time building rapport and I've gotten censured that from some of my clients as well as some of my colleagues that I spend too much time with the sellers. But I respectfully disagree. And examples, think about the times where someone spent time with you and didn't have to and could help you with your problem. An example is someone in this room here before I came up here over the weekend coached me unsolicitedly on what to do up here. Do you think I'm gonna do business with that person the rest of my life? Sitting in this room, absolutely. Because he didn't have to do that. We would still do business anyways, but now this person has my loyalty for the rest of my life. Because he saw that I had a need and I didn't ask, but he knew that I needed his help. So another example would be, so I've spoken with a guy and he you know, wanted to sell, he had some of the pillars of motivation, and he wanted a one story because he had a poodle that needed pain medication just to get down the stairs. So I listened to him talk about this dog that he loved, it's the only companion he had after his wife died. I'm not gonna cut him off, you know? And so the way I'd bring it back is, you always wanna tie it back to the property if you can, whenever they wanna tell you about these things. So what do you think would be different if Fluffy went from a two-story to a ranch like you mentioned? He said, well, she might be able to get off the pain pills just to go to the bathroom. And I do want to iterate this. Not everyone has a caring nature, and you don't have to. There's nothing wrong with that. I had a, a great coworker. His name was Chris, acquisition manager, and he just was not a caring guy. But, and that's okay. I learned from him, he learned from me. But he was a good, active listener. So you don't have to be a caring person, you just have to be quiet and be an active listener. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is, yes it is, especially when they're telling really long stories, but that's all you have to do. <laughs> so what's next? That's the green light that you're looking for. You know you've done your job whenever the home seller says, okay, this all sounds good, so what's next? How do we move this process forward? Great job, you've done your job whenever they ask you. So what's next? What's the next step? And so like I said, remember, sellers are only after one thing and they don't wanna date you. So yes, terms matter, but most people are talking to you just to hear your price. So most sellers don't realize how terms of the sale matter as well, like I discussed. And so most people are there to just get your price and then go shop with it. How many of you have given a price and then had someone just ghost you? And I better see everyone in this room raise their hand. <laughs> you give them a price and they just completely disappear, right? So I learned. And then you or your VA is playing the forever follow-up game. So no one ever appreciates anything easy. Make them earn the offer. Instant gratification is the enemy to success in general, in any business, and in closing your deals. One of my mentors said, if you want instant gratification in this business, you're gonna get a big fat goose egg. So take your time and set a commitment shows that you're serious when you create a well-considered offer. So what I say is, hey, when would be a good time for us to sit down in front of your computer or in your living room, Starbucks, whatever the situation calls for, and go over this offer? So let me repeat that. When would be a good time for us to sit down in front of your computer and go over this offer? No price without commitment, or you will just get ghosted and you'll be giving free appraisals all day. So what do you do if a seller's gone dark, right? I'll tell you what I do when a seller goes dark. There's a systematized process. Everything I do is extremely routine and systemized so that I can get the highest level of results consistently. So I call from a different phone number. I will call back once a day for a week, then every other day for a week. And after two days, two to three days, to one week, depending on their situation, I send this text. And if some of you ever go ghost on me, you're gonna get the same text. 
You know, I feel like I must have said the wrong thing. This is totally on me. I must have really messed things up. Was it me, the contract, or the price? I know it's one of the three, and I'm so sorry I messed things up. That warrants a response almost 100% of the time because people feel compelled to let you know that you didn't really do anything wrong. So it's hard to do for proud people, right? I'm a proud person, so it's, it, at first it was hard for me to send that text. But you take your pride and sweep it under the rug because we're here to convert, right? We're not here to be proud. So uh, going not okay, right? Meaning showing that you're in some form of minor distress and going negative, meaning you're assuming that they don't want it is really tough, but it converts. It really does, and I do get a response to this text. It works almost every time. So when a seller goes dark, so here's, the th here's why they go dark. So the text assumes that you did something wrong. You're taking the blame off the seller because at that point, they are embarrassed and ashamed that they ghosted you to price shop. They are embarrassed that they ghosted you. They are. And also, to speak the truth, discount home sellers are often procrastinators. It's why they're selling for a discount after deferred maintenance. So they will procrastinate selling as well. I don't bring that up, of course. What I say is, you know, I know you're a good person who just got busy, because it's true. They're good people. They just got busy, right? I always try to make them the hero. I totally understand why you didn't text me back, because you're a good person who's taking care of your family, and certain things get put by the wayside. So and if they do go dark and you did nothing wrong other than give the price up too easily, we all do it. The goal is just to do it less through practice. Also, I've never, ever, ever done business with anyone who pressured hard on price up front without a lot of questions and consideration, right? So the people who pressure hard up front are just wanting a free appraisal, and we're not in the business of giving free appraisal. We're gonna leave the appraisals to Corey, right? Wave over there, Corey. <laughs> So again, repetition puts it in our brains, no price giving without commitment, unless we're disqualifying on price, meaning there's no other motivations, no other sign that they're going to sell, and we're just using price to disqualify them entirely. It doesn't feel good to give free appraisals all day, does it? It doesn't feel good to put all this money into marketing, take your time, give prices, and then just have people go ghost on you. So protect your time, protect your investment in your marketing, and get those commitments. Whenever a seller says, just send an offer to my email. I just want a price. I just want to send, just you know, send the offer to my email. That's a blow off. Yeah, that's for them to go shopping with it. They did a study on places that were losing a lot of conversions. And it was because they were sending an offer without having them go over it. So here's what we adapted to. I totally understand that you're just wanting to see what we'd offer and you don't want a lot of your time tied up or a high pressure scenario. And see, in creating a specific solution for you, there's a lot more to it than just price. So in order to do you justice, we sit down and go everything paragraph by paragraph because this is a big decision. If your wife, attorney, realtor, sibling, whoever would like to be there as well, it really works best if all decision makers are there to go over this together I just want to make sure that the entire process is understood, right? So I'll send people contracts and they'll ghost me based on the smallest thing. And that's what I'm about to bring up here. So here's some of the objections to the contract. And let me know if some of this is relevant or not. Give me a little feedback and I'm happy to go through it faster and more slowly. Uh, definitely want to be interactive and create value for the audience. So uh, some of the objections I get while reading the contract is you said cash as is, but your contract says you need an inspection period. So why do you inspect if you're just buying as is? Does this happen to anyone? Yeah. So what I say is, you know, you're absolutely right that it is as is, and I know you've done an awesome job taking care of your properties. My partners just need one hour on one day to come by and make sure that when you say two bedrooms, two bathrooms, it really is two bathrooms and not a Homer's bucket in the basement with a camping shower. We had one guy who said he had a two bathroom, two bedroom, 
And when we went to inspect his house, it was a homer's bucket with a camping shower and towels around it. And that's what he considered his second bathroom. And when I tell them that story, it always makes them laugh. It lightens the mood and I can't believe someone did that. I said, yeah, so we're, we're just coming in to make sure that when you tell us two bedrooms, two baths, that's what it really is. Of course, we're looking for a lot more than that, but it kind of calms them down, right? So I tell that story. And make sure that you're using very easygoing, you know, vocal tones with a smile on your face. They can hear that, you know, make it a fun thing, and they'll respond well. So that, that's, that's, that was their second bathroom. Um, <laughs> it's very creative and very economical, but not something that we can, you know, lend on, so. So common uh, contract object, notice to enter the property. I lost one guy because our contract said 48 hours to come in and he had given a lease to his tenants saying 72 hours. And he wouldn't call me back. So I had to have my partner call him back and go, hey, what happened? Well, your contract said 48 hours and I need to give my tenant 72 hours. That's very fixable. We can fix that right now, no problem. And this is why we need to go over the contract with them live so that any little things like this that we can fix, we can fix 100% on the spot. And also know your contracts because as you're going through the contracts with them, if you're kind of going too slow and not really knowing what something is, they're gonna take that as a lack of confidence. If you go too fast, they're gonna think you're not telling them something. So you have to take a moderate pace, taking them paragraph by paragraph. She's nodding her head, she knows. Uh, and that way you show confidence as well as caring. And the last one, I think it's the last one, is the earnest money deposit. So we're all doing this professionally. And so we can't be doing big earnest money deposits like you would as an occupant buyer. Am I right? Or you'll be out of, out of money quick, right? So I get a lot of objections on, well, why is your earnest money $100, $200? You know, why is it so low? And the way I explain it is, we buy two to three properties per week. And if we were tying it up in earnest money, we wouldn't be able to buy as many properties. Whereas your typical occupant buyer maybe buys two, three houses in their entire life. That's how many we're buying in a week. So we keep our earnest money low. We are motivated to close. I know you're worried that because of this low earnest money, maybe we don't have a lot of money or maybe we're not motivated. This is what we do for a living. We very much want to close. And this usually makes it okay. But if you get, usually it's because they get their attorney, Jeff, <laughs> who tells them you need to hire an earnest money deposit. We get that a lot whenever attorneys look over the contract. If the deal numbers are right, don't lose a deal over sticking to a hard, fast earnest money deposit rule. Be flexible on that and you can still get a good deal. So the stickiest part of offering a discount price is you probably all heard this, you're not gonna lowball me, are you? Oh, thank you, Jeff. You're not gonna lowball me, are you? Right, who's heard that? And I say, okay, well, so it looks like other investors in the area, they were paying about $60,000 for a property that's this size and condition in your neighborhood. There's no way you'd go for that, would you? And if they laugh or cuss at you, okay, which happens a lot, let's be honest, just go more not okay and make them the hero again. That way you can salvage. You know, I'm so sorry, this is all my fault. You know, based on a cash offer, this is all I can afford with the cost of labor and materials going up. I know where you're coming from and you must have a better price in mind that would work for you. And then I'd say, so what price did you have in mind? So again, I'll repeat that because I use this every day and it's very important in getting to price, okay? It looks like other investors in the area were paying about 60,000 for a property that's this size and condition in your neighborhood. There's no way you'd go for that, would you? And that's how I pitch it every single day. And they'll tell you, yeah, well, I don't know. I, can't, I don't know if I could do 60, but maybe 70. Well, then you know you're, you're playing ball. So yeah, we, we missed whenever we were throwing up balls this low a couple of years back. Now they're all a little bit higher and we are just gonna move right on through this market. So if they tell you that a price is much higher than max allowable offer, then you know use an exit strategy that's gonna work for that. Also, I noticed meeting in person can help to bring the price down. I've, I do all of my acquisitions virtually, but I try to have a partner who's out in the field 
and that makes it easier to negotiate lower. So because they're there in person, it's a little bit easier to build rapport, and they know that we can see the inside of their property. And so always be casting your nets. Uh, don't start marketing or looking for deals just because you think you currently have enough. This is something I see investors do. I know everyone's goals are different, but if you're doing this full time, don't feel like, oh, well, I've got plenty of deals in the pipeline now, so I'm gonna hold off. Well, you know, three months from now, because you stop marketing, you're not gonna have more deals in the pipeline. So keep your marketing going if you're doing this full time. Do not stop. So when they say yes to your price, yet yeah, this is how it feels every time. I always get this excited every time. Like, yes, on the inside, right? So exciting, I love doing it. So if you get a price that's within their range, this is the hardest thing to do because you want it so bad, you've got to pull back on the sale at that point. You've got to pull it back. So just like in fishing, okay, sometimes you have to stop pulling so the hook sinks deeper, right? That way they swallow it. So I like to fish, right? If I know I've got one on the line and I know it's stuck, I'm gonna stop reeling because I want them to swallow that hook. I want it deep. And I've got my pliers ready so I can pull it out, right? So this good dog here is doing so well not eating that steak and that's what it feels like whenever you're pulling back on the deal whenever you want them to sign so badly right you just you just want them to sign but you have to discipline yourself to pull back and say you know that's great i'm glad the 60,000 would work but before we sign i know this is a big decision is there anything we haven't covered that you might have any questions about and then just go silent because this is where you're gonna find your silent deal killers that are gonna come up during transaction coordination. And you wanna make, sure, and the title and inspection are started and then these things come up. You wanna avoid that. So just be disciplined like the sweet little doggy here. Pull back and ask that question. Some last minute questions I get from the seller, short on time, so you can read those. I can, happy to send these slides out to anyone who wants to come up to me, hand me your business card and I'll make it a priority to send these out when I get back to Texas. So the most important one, if I want to bring it out, is, hey, while you're buying this property, do you have any interest in buying this property in XYZ random state? People have the most random properties in the most random states. The answer is always yes, because you're in this room and somebody in this room is going to help you move that deal. And that is one of the things that they ask me in those last minute questions. Uh, their number one fear is leaving money on the table. That is the main reason why they shop for price. That is their number one fear before they close, is leaving money on the table. So you wanna give them an opportunity to feel like they're squeezing every possible penny out of your offer. So they might say something like, could you go any higher on price? You know, I was really looking more for like 65, 70K. And that's whenever the old school haggling comes into play. So give something to get something to maintain credibility. If you can't just go up arbitrarily, you're gonna think that you're not a credible person. So you have to exchange something to get something, right? So I might say, you know, I could maybe come up to 62,500. If you could make sure that that garage is cleaned out of old boxes and you get rid of that cat piece smell. Because I know everyone here has purchased a property that had a cat piece smell in it at some point. It's just part of the, part of the deal, right? Or I could go up to say, and here's a random number that some people like, because it psychologically tells them this is a stopping point. I could go up to 65,353 if you painted the exterior and cleaned out the boxes, right? Or let's say I could go up to 70,000 if you could do, you know, paint the interior, leave the furnishings in the house, and be moved out in instead of three weeks, instead of five weeks, right? So the higher up you go, you, the more you want them to exchange value, even if it's something that's not important to you. In fact, I hope it's not something that's important to you. And just make it seem important, right? So almost done here. Finally, time to sign, right? At this point, you've done all your due diligence. You've eliminated every possible deal killer. Get them to sign and remind them how the process works and that your transaction coordinator, someone like Allie, uh, will be in touch. And also, I'm sure Jeff would agree, you wanna make sure that when it, before you acquire, that these people are sober and of sound mind. It shouldn't have to be said, but many of these people are not either, okay? 
And we want to make sure that if they seem like they're too old, you need to go with that and, and, and be assertive on making sure they have a proper power of attorney. Okay, and a lot of times I'll call on Saturday night. That's whenever I get my best deals often. That's because they tell me the truth because they're drunk. <laughs> but guess what, I'm not gonna get them to sign on Saturday night. I'm gonna make a commitment that they give me a call back or I'll call them on Monday morning. So just keep that in mind. And I wanted to give credit to, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants today. Some of the things I've said may seem familiar um, John Martinez, Jerry Green, Joseph Terrio, Greg Helbeck, Elizabeth Lunsford, Connor Steinbrook, who's here with us today, Barrett Newsom, Jeff, who's here with us today, and Brett Daniels. All of these people have contributed specific things to my mindset and to my script that is helping me close every single day. And here are some books. The most important one I think you can read is Go For No by Richard Fanton. This is the book that got me over my fear of no's. I'm human being, I hate rejection, but I've learned to love it. You know, thank you, sir, may I have another, right? Because of this book. And if you read no other book, read that. Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Paul Cialdini. Presuasion, how you basically butter people up. Objections by Jeb Blunt, how I raised myself from failure to success in selling. Stalling for Time by Gary Nesner. He is another FBI uh, negotiator. He was the boss of Chris Voss. The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, so you know how people think, and The Art of Seduction, which basically is just closing. I know he put a sexy title on it, but it really translates into closing, The Art of Seduction by Robert Greene. And I wanna say that you're welcome to contact me through here. And ever since I joined Jim Ingersoll in Inner Circle two years ago, I just wanna say there's nothing better than combining real estate investing and friendship, am I right? Is there anything better, guys? If there is, I'm not sure I found it. And ever since I joined Inner Circle and combined the skill set that I've worked very hard to build with the friends that I've made, I don't worry about money anymore. That first picture of me with my son, we were in Zion. That morning, I got my laptop, called back some warm calls, closed the deal, and then and went and hiked the Narrows with my sons. I'm a great steward of my money, I pay close attention to it, but I don't worry about it anymore. And I know that for all of you who are in this room today, if you're closing deals, if you learn how to close deals, the money will come to you. Hand over fist, consistently, keep up your marketing, keep your mindset, keep your skills sharp, and access your network. And I believe in every single one of you. If you come up against a belief stall, Whenever you're making these calls or you're trying to, I want you to reach out to me, and I mean that sincerely. I want you to ping me in my DMs. I want you to get in my inbox and say, Jennifer, I'm trying to do this, and I just can't do it today. I just don't feel like it's for me. Please message me, because I'm gonna make you believe in yourself, okay? All right, guys, thank you so much.